think it's just sorting itself out. It hasn't come up as being recorded. There we go. All right, welcome um, Deb and Shelley to um, our webinar. This is our first one we've run since launching our enhancements uh, over the weekend. So um, please bear with us. If you've got any questions, just um, feel free to take yourself off mute. We'll have a bit of a chat. Um, but um, yeah, so just to, to kick off, um, so the first um, first thing I guess is uh, our enhancements were implemented over the weekend for all our, all our land plan runs, so maternal, terminal, etc. Um, and the merino results, um, Shelley, you can expect to see those um, probably hopefully later today. So we'll send an email out again to everyone to let you know when they're available to to jump onto the to the website. Um, so the plan for today, um, we'll be just recapping all the different things that we've implemented as part of our enhancements this year. Um, so index updates, reproduction updates, database redevelopment, and then Chloe will spend some time going through um, how to access those results through the new results portal um, and how you can you can find your genetic trends and all that information. So um, really we'll be just recapping um, briefly why we've, we've seen changes. We won't be going into as much detail um, as that, as we did because we do have those other webinars available on the really specifics, ins and outs of um, of what's of, of why the changes have occurred. We'll be just recapping why. Um, but yeah, again, feel free to, to jump off mute any time. So um, I guess the key enhancements for, for this year, there's really two key themes to why we're seeing change. Um, and why we've implemented what we have. And the first is re, um, around creating better breeding values through improved analysis. So we want to make sure that you have the best predictions on farm to drive genetic progress for whatever traits you're interested in. So the, the new analysis really does this. And also we needed to make sure our analysis was able to hand the growing amounts of, of genotypes and growing amounts of data that we're seeing being submitted to sheep genetics. So. They, um, they're really the two key themes about why we've made change and, and the involvement of, um, so all the research and development behind these have been done by the Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit based here in uh, Armidale. Um, so they, all the research scientists there have done, done the work and we've implemented it into our routine sheep genetics evaluations. And as I said, the, the, the changes we'll be seeing uh, from the 1st of May run for land plan and the 7th for Merino Select. So this year has been probably one of the biggest years of changes at Sheep Genetics, you know, since its inception um, back in 2005. And I think the slide on the screen kind of shows why. Um, these are all the different things that have been implemented that would be, um, that are impacting the analysis. So we'll spend a little bit more time on the ones that aren't circled and go through these in a bit more detail. But the ones that are circled, I just thought I'd touch on briefly. Um, I don't think they, um, the top two certainly don't impact um, anyone on, on, on the call, but uh, we are now reporting our corridors just from the maternal analysis. So they used to have their own special small analysis, but they didn't have access to IMF or shear force breeding values like they did when they were in the maternal analysis. So now we're just reporting corridors from that. Um, and our, we've um, also had an, an agreement in place with the Australian Dooney Breeders Association um, but because of our new database, which is the other development you see there on the on the right, um, we've had to change that agreement. So um, we'll, we'll be working with any journey, journey breeders. The two that do impact um, do impact breeding values that we won't spend a lot of time in um, are, well, it's small impacts, I should say. Well, TBLUP, um, which is basically the, the logic we use to use genomic information in the analysis. Which was, we're only implemented for, breed, uh, for merinos. This actually won't change any breeding values. All this enhancement does is actually just allow us to keep running the merino run now that we've got more than 200,000 genotypes included in the analysis. So it's a pretty cool piece of science, but it actually doesn't change any breeding values. Likewise with the, with the accuracy algorithm. So we have to calculate an accuracy on every breeding value and index. Um, the um, New accuracy algorithm, again, was to deal with this growing amount of genomic information because we take into account um, an animal's genomic relationship. We calculate the, the accuracy for a trait. 
So to deal with those growing number of genotypes, we've implemented a new algorithm. Doesn't change the breeding values at all, this enhancement, um, but it will, um, it, it will change the accuracy on some breeding values. So you might see um, for some traits, a small decrease in the accuracy of the breeding value. Nothing too much, but but mainly for um, for, for some carcass related traits. So um, no changes to breeding values from those, but they uh, will impact the accuracy slightly. All right, um, so the as you can expect, with all those different changes, and we've just gone live for land plan, we expect to go live later today um, with Merinos. Um, but we we are ex, um, experiencing a large number of queries at the moment, as you can expect with breeding value movement. So if you do have any queries um, or for breeding values or indexes, please reach out to Chloe uh, or Gabby, our development officers. If you do have any queries, um, and Chloe will go through the steps a little bit later about accessing results or about the website, um, please contact our, our either the development officers or, Sh or Sheep Genetics, the, the normal main number. Um, but we are all the time making updates to the website and reports to make sure that these are available, you have access to them, uh, and, and they're also um, you know, we, we do expect some, some small problems with them. We've tried to make them um, as well as we can, but, you know, it's always different with a thousand odd breeders using them versus a handful of us. So if you are experiencing any problems, please let us know. Um, we do have a team of developers that are constantly working on making these these improvements to that. So we're looking forward to where we can continue to build and, and create that um, portal. Um, also to help with the changes, we are developing documentation for our RAM for RAM buyers, so your clients, to help understand some of the new traits like weaning rate, um, which Emma will talk to a little bit later. Um, but um, so we, that that documentation development is underway at the moment. Well, good again, Deb or Shelley, if there's any questions, um, please just jump off and and let us know. Uh, jump off mute, I should say, not jump off the call. Um, apologies. Uh, so the next uh, topic is, um, which kind of sets the scene for some of the other changes we'll see, is the index review and the update. So this year we have made updates to our merino, maternal and terminal indexes. So we'll talk a little bit about what those updates are. And um, we all also are looking at redeveloping our Merino indexes. So we expect new indexes for Merinos to be available uh, this time next year when we implement enhancements. So for that timeline of development of Merino indexes, um, first of all, we have to actually do this phase one, which is the development. And this is updating the software that we use to calculate indexes. So um, we want to be able to include traits that we haven't before that are becoming important, like breech wrinkle, uh, DAG, et cetera, uh, condition score. So we have to update uh, Sheep Object, that, which is the software that we use to create those indexes. So that, that development and refinement is underway as we speak. Then once that work's done, we can actually begin to develop some new indexes. And we want to be able to test those really between July and September this year. So these are testing some of the economic assumptions, so the price of wool, price of lamb in, in different scenarios, um, as well as in, including these new traits, testing them with our breeders, making sure that the assumptions that we've used are correct. We'll obviously take any feedback from that and include it in a refinement phase of the, of the index review, uh, which will be run in the latter half of this year. Um, and then we should hopefully have our indexes ready to go this time next year. So what has actually changed this year though, um, we do have improvements to the Merino indexes and maternal indexes, which Emma will talk about with the inclusion of weaning rate. We've updated our terminal indexes, which I'll talk to uh, very briefly. And for maternals, we've also removed the old maternal dollar index, which never had uh, any pressure on adult weight. So um, that index has been removed and we've been looking to phase that out for a number of years. Um, and, and as part of all our index reviews, we are looking to have a more ongoing process of, of updating indexes. Um, there's been some small changes this year, big merino changes next year. How do we routinely um, maintain and update our indexes? 
So terminal indexes, so I'll, I'll briefly touch on these, um, not that they impact everyone, but uh, for our terminal analysis this year, um, we've taken our existing indexes that we had available, so TCP, EQ, LEQ, and added lambing ease to those indexes. Um, so lambing ease direct uh, is the measure that has been added to the terminal indexes. And really that's um, from, from feedback we got from our breeders as part of our first index review was that we had these indexes, but there was some high birth weight sires that were coming to the top that were people were concerned about, uh, given dystochia and lamb survival being hot topics at the moment. So we wanted to make sure that we had indexes that reflected um, the, or, or penalise those animals that were having trouble um, or whose progeny were having trouble at lambing. So what we did, we've incorporated lambing is direct into all our standard terminal indexes as an economic trait. So we actually costed what is the economic cost to the business um, when you have to go and pull a lamb and the, the average ewe mortality or lamb mortality when you do have to intervene and have assistance. So it's an, it's an economic trait. It's a trait we can look at economically. So we have included uh, lambing ease uh, as a trait, an economic trait in all our indexes. So as you can see, the graphs on the right show the correlation between the old, which is across the x-axis, and the new indexes. So looking at the top there, we've got TCP, um, terminal carcass production index. You can see the correlation is nearly 98% or 97%. It's, it's pretty high. So the good size is still good size. The bottom size is still the bottom size. And we do have a little bit of re-ranking, but mainly you can see those dots along the bottom, um, uh, along the um, where, where animals have dropped out. So where they've had a reasonably high TCP, but they have um, they've dropped out on the, on the new one. And they're really size that had poor lambing ease breeding values, which is what we'd expect when we include the trade in the index. So most animals, there's a little bit of re-ranking. Uh, it's only been those animals that perform quite poorly for that trait that have been, uh, that have had a significant drop in index. The important thing, and this is important whether we're talking about terminal indexes, the changes to maternal, um, or, or, or any of our other, the, the database changes as well we'll speak about, is that there's been significant change and what was a good breeding value last week in our old analysis is different to since we've implemented these changes. So um, it will take people a little while, myself included, uh, to understand what is a good breeding value, what's the top new top 5%, 10%, average 20%, etc. What are those new numbers? And you can see here, um, if we look at the TCP index from all the changes this year, including the inclusion of lambing ease, you know, what was in the top 5% was a, an animal that had an index of 156.6. Now the new top 5% is that 150.4. So you can see that there's kind of been a, um, whilst the indexes are correlated with all the other changes that we've implemented, what was a good breeding value just needs to be re-benchmarked re in, in everyone's heads. So, it's really important, and Chloe will talk about later, is accessing these percentile bands to understand where your where you now sit um, relative, because um, you can't rely on oh, the old average used to be 140 um, or, or whatever it might have been. Um, it that has changed, so we we really need to be looking at these percentile bands to understand what's what's a good breeding value, top five, 10, 20 percent, etc. And with We've had a few questions since we've, um, even before we've implemented lambing ease, um, is actually around the scoring guide. So this is relevant for anyone that is doing lambing rounds. So whether it be maternal, merino, um, or terminal, this is the uh, this is the scoring guide for for lambing ease. So if you are um, if you are doing lambing rounds, strongly recommend uh, capturing this information to help inform the lambing ease breeding value. So you, um, if note, if you aren't um, actually doing lambing rounds or um, observing if an animal has to have intervention at, at the lambing site, um, please score that as a zero. But if you are you are doing lambing rounds and, and um, understand which animals have to be pulled and which ones don't, um, this is the scoring guide to use. So if it's an unassisted birth, you get there and the lamb's born happy, healthy and alive, um, that's a score one. Um, score two is a slight intervention, so a, a, an easy or mod to moderate pull. 
Um, three is a hard pull, so it, it was quite a difficult birth um, that you that you assisted the year with. And then four was male presentation. So we don't actually use scores four or five in the analysis because we don't have very many of them. But male presentation encompasses things that are that are breach, for example, or or have a a, le a leg a long way back, um, etc. Whereas your easy and moderate pulls those those slight interventions that you might have to have at the birth site. And so for those terminal breeders that aren't recording lambing ease, um, but might be recapturing other traits like birth weight, the lambing ease breeding value that we're using in the index does use this correlated information from birth weight. But as our message is, is, always is, is if you're interested in that trait, it's really important if you can to record that trait. So if you're doing lambing rounds, lambing ease is a pretty easy piece of information to capture. So just to, to quickly summarise, um, those for terminal indexes this year, we've included lambing ease. There's been some small changes um, that really require you just to re-benchmark yourselves on the percentiles. Um, but really the most impacted animals are those sires in particular that have had progeny recorded where they've performed quite poorly for, for lambing ease. Um, so they're the ones that are most impacted. All right, I'll hand over to M to go through our reproduction updates. Thanks, Peter. Um, so my job today is to give an update on um, a new reproduction trait that we're releasing for our Merino Select and Maternal Breeders. Um, and this new trait will also be included in indexes. So this new um, reproduction trait we're calling weaning rate or WR and what it's doing is it's combining our component traits so those traits conception, litter size and new rearing ability that we've had um, now for maternals and merinos we've had them for a couple of years. We had some feedback from industry that said it was great to have the component traits which allowed us to make targeted genetic gain however for say a you know a commercial ram buyer having a single um, reproduction trait was still quite useful for making um, selection decisions. So what we've done is we've um, gone, we've revisited it and we've combined those component traits back into a, um, a single net reproduction value. Um, because we're using the component traits, this new weaning rate trait is available for our merino and maternal breeders who already have access to the component traits. And what it's describing is the number of lambs weaned per U joint and it's in, expressed in lambs. So this new weaning rate trait is going to be replacing number of, well, sorry, as of this afternoon for merinos and has already for maternal guys, um, replaced number of lambs weaned is our reproduction trait. Uh, one thing on, re, on weaning rate is that what we've, when we've brought these component traits together to combine them, what we've taken into account is the relative importance of conception, litter size, and new rearing ability at different flock litter sizes. So if you have a look at the um, the graph on the screen, what we're looking at here is at different litter sizes, so across the horizontal, we've got our different flock litter sizes. We're looking at the relative economic value or the relative importance of each of our component traits. So we can see in the black line there, we've got conception. So as our flock litter size increases, conception reaches a point where it kind of plateaus in terms of economic contribution um, to gain for that for that flock at a high litter size. Whereas a trait like you rearing ability in the blue, it continues to increase. So as we have more lambs, um, there's in, it's increasingly important to keep those lambs alive through to weaning. So that's how we've actually derived this weaning rate trait is to try and account for different flock litter sizes and survival rates. Because weaning rate and number of lambs weaned have the same trait definition, we've been able to replace NLW in our indexes as well. So moving away from reporting NLW at all in these marine in the merino select and maternal evaluation. However, by adding weaning rate in as a replacement for number of lambs weaned, we are seeing um, a bit of re-ranking and there are some changes to averages for the for different evaluations. Um, so as Peter was just saying, it's really important to make sure we're re-benchmarking um, what, what is a good reproduction value, but also what is a good index. So I've just taken a screenshot here. This is a couple of maternal animals um, 
from the search site. And you can see there we're, we're now reporting weaning rate as one of our default traits on the search site, um, which is on the on the right hand of that uh, on the right hand side of that screenshot down there, WR. Um, so you're able to go and check out the weaning rate figures that you're getting on your animals. Um, a little bit repetitive from what Peter was saying, but it is really important that you're rebenchmarking, and we can do this using our percentiles. So again, I've um, pinched this off the web, so Chloe will show you where to where to find these later. Um, but this is just a screenshot of our maternal um, percentiles for our reproduction traits. Um, so we can see that, particularly given weaning rates now in the unit of lambs rather than um, as a percent, which NLW was, it's a pretty different looking number being a decimal. So it'll be important that we rebenchmark to work out um, what is a what is a good breeding value. We are recommending that for ram breeders who are getting the component traits reported on their animals that they're still using that in their breeding objective and their selection decisions, because the component traits are still there to help you make that targeted genetic gain. Um, and when you come to say you know uh, diagnosing weaning rate breeding values. So say you're looking at a weaning rate and it looks a bit obscure to you. The first step is to actually look at those component traits. Given that we're calculating weaning rate from the component traits, it'll be really important to have a look at conception, litter size and new rearing ability as a starting point um, to try and identify what might be driving that breeding value. Um, so, as I was saying, this new reproduction trait weaning rate is available for um, our maternal guys now and will be available in Merino results this afternoon. What this means is that we're no longer record reporting number of lambs weaned for those two evaluations. Um, and as part of that, we've also included weaning rate in our indexes as the reproduction trait. So we'll see some changes in indexes as well, similar to what Peter um, took us through with the terminal indexes. Does anyone have any questions on weaning rate at all? All right, well, I'll keep moving, uh, but feel free if you do have any questions to unmute or just pop them in the chat too. Um, so my next job is to talk a bit about the database redevelopment, which has been a major piece of work um, for sheep genetics, for AgBoo, um, and for um, the developers that we've employed to help us through this process. So the database redevelopment will impact all evaluations. And there'll be two major changes that you'll see. The first is that there'll be changes in breeding values. And I'm going to spend some time going through the reasons why we're going to see changes in breeding values now. Um, and then there's also changes to the way that we're reporting results, which Chloe will take you through um, a little bit later. Um, so as I said, the database redevelopment's been a, a huge undertaking by the team. Um, and it's been done over several phases. The first was that we had a whole bunch of separate databases sitting, sitting separately, um, quite distinct and quite different in the way that we were using and preparing data for those, in, uh, for those databases. So that's where we had, you know, Merino selecting separately to land plan. And then we also had our research databases sitting separately again. So our first job as part of the database redevelopment was to actually bring them all together into a single data warehouse. We then needed to work on a pipeline that we could continue to update your on-farm data into the evaluation, which um, we're still refining at the moment. So when you are submitting data to this new data warehouse, you still do it in the same way that you currently do, where you email Hermes or Stephen your file out of your software um, and they will upload it on your behalf. We then needed to review the rules around um, the data that we actually sent off to be analysed by OVIS, so by our genetic evaluation technology. And then finally, we needed to actually be able to report breeding values back out of this new system. Um, so we've improved the reporting methods and the way that um, the way that we display breeding values, you access breeding values, and then also the way that um, this information's uh, included back into your software. So that um, that last stage there, that's what Chloe will be focusing on 
I'm going to be focusing on the analysis of the data part of this diagram. In terms of um, why we've actually undergone our database redevelopment, as you could see there, there were several different databases. Um, we had some concerns around serviceability and the risk associated with having multiple distinct um, databases. They're all written in slightly different languages using pretty old systems. Um, you know, the land plan evaluation has been around for 30 years. So, um, you know, the, te the technological world has been moving forward in leaps and bounds over the last 30 years. You can, if you look at your mobile phone right now, it's a pretty good example of how far we've come. So it's really important to make sure that we were moving with the times. The other big concern that we had was actually scalability too. So Peter mentioned earlier about, um, you know, the number of new genotypes we have coming in each year um, poses a, a serious um, logistical issue for us to store all of that information. So by undergoing this database redevelopment, we've been able to tackle some of those problems to really set us up for long-term um, delivery of genetic evaluations. So out of this, using this new data warehouse um, that we've developed will mean that we're going to see breeding value movement. And the major part of the process that's leading to breeding value movement is actually when we export the data from this single data warehouse to, to OVIS to the analysis. And there's a few key reasons for the changes at this stage. The first is that we've reviewed um, the business rules around the way that we include animals in an analysis with their data and their pedigree. So for our Merino run, we have a set breed list that we export out for that, for that Merino run. However, what we've been able to do is actually review it so that we know that we're including all of the relevant data and pedigree information on, on relevant animals for that run. Um, the second part is that the database redevelopment gave us an the opportunity to review the way we were filtering data. So we've actually been able to make it more consistent between Merino Select and Land Plan in terms of um, you know, our exclusion thresholds and trait limits. Um, so it's great to be able to make that more consistent through this process. We've updated the way that we allocate records to age stages. So previously um, you would supply, let's say a post weaning weight. So you would supply it as a P weight um, to us we would then allocate it based on, you know, you told us it was post weaning, so we, we put it into post weaning. What we're actually doing in the new database is you will still supply that as a P weight, but we're double checking for you the age of that animal. So we're looking at the date of birth and the date of measurement and making sure that it does fit in a post weaning measurement, in, a, in the post weaning age stage. What this does mean is that we're doing a better job of allocating genetic parameters based on the age of the animal. So you know, for something like your heritabilities or your correlations, we know we're using the correct ones because we're actually checking the age of the animal whenever we get a measurement from you. Uh, the next reason that we've seen breeding value movement is uh, we've updated the way that we're building carcass files. So previously, um, we actually weren't, if, if we had, say, we had meat science or, or eating quality data on an animal, we weren't taking into account how it had been managed on farm because historically a lot of that data was coming from research flocks that were all running together through like you know they were lambed down together run together through their lifetime and then killed together so we didn't need to um, take into account management on farm because they were all being managed the same however in the last few years we've got a lot more um, meat science information coming in from breeder flocks so we needed to be able to bring in the on-farm information for that animal and the, and the carcass information and actually bring those two, um, what are different files together so that we're actually accounting for the correct management of an animal prior to slaughter. So that's um, caused some changes, particularly in our eating quality breeding values. And then finally, um, each of those four reasons that I've just gone through have all impacted the lifetime grouping um, that we're using for animals. So that's, you know, say for example, we do have progeny that are killed in an abattoir. We're now better accounting for their lifetime grouping prior to slaughter. Um, so yeah, we're doing a better job of handling management information.
one thing that breeders can do or can can keep in mind going forward is that um, with this this new way of allocating age stages in our system, um, to ensure that we're getting it right, it's going to be really important to make sure that you're recording the traits at the right time for you. So um, in your breeding objective, you know, you've got traits there and you've got time frames around when you're trying to target performance for those traits. So when you are capturing um, capturing measurements, it's ensure, important to make sure you're recording the animals when the average of you, that management group best fits within the age range you're trying to target. Um, and we've got the age ranges there on the screen um, and we can share these. Um, they've also been shared with all the softwares as well. So um, that information should be should be wherever you need it. But if you'd like a copy of them, we can also share them with you. So that's a very quick summary of pretty huge, huge lump of work that's been done. Um, as Peter was saying, this is one of or, or the biggest change um, that we've seen in our genetic in our sheep genetics genetic evaluations. So particularly this database redevelopment, it's impacting all of our analyses. Um, and from that, we are seeing changes in breeding values. So again, it's really important to check out those percentile bands. Um, firstly, check out your animals, but also check out your percentile bands to see where those animals sit now. Um, and there are also changes to the way that you access your data, which Chloe will take us through now, I think. So um, today I'll be taking you through some of the website updates, including how to access your new results and the new percentiles that we were discussing throughout this webinar. Um, there's also a few improvements to search site functionality that we'll also go through. So one of the major redevelopments is the new way to access results. So you will submit your data as normal, as we discussed just earlier. Um, you'll receive a notification when your results are ready. On this email will be a link to the search site. You'll click on that link, uh, you'll log into the search site, and if your um, search site account is linked to your flock, you'll be able to access your results. You can also access some DQS reports as well as your analysis results reports. So here I've just got a screenshot showing where to log in. In order for you to be able to access these results, it is essential that your search site account is linked to your flock and it's also linked to any service providers that you wish to have access to your results. So once you've logged in, this is what the new um, dashboard will look like. And if you are not sure whether or not your account is linked, you can see here from this box whether or not it's linked. If your account is linked, you'll be able to have your flock code, your flock and any names of service providers that you have already linked. So that's a good way for you to be able to check. If you're not seeing this box or if there's something wrong, um, there is some help documentation on how to link your account and you can also contact Sheep Genetics. So accessing the results and reports is through this Your Flock box. Um, to access your data quality report, you click on the little tile that's circled in purple here and it will take you to the data quality score. This is what it looks like. Um, you'll fill in this field with your flock code, what analysis you're using, the correct index and the correct site. Once all of those are filled in and if they are correct, these generate and download report tiles will turn green where previously they would have been grey. You can click either of those to either generate or download the um, DQS report into a PDF. And there's also, um, as indicated here by the little red arrow, some help um, documentation available along the way for you to use. Accessing results is using the same flock box that we were discussing. However, instead of clicking the data quality, you'll click the one um, circled in yellow, which is the reports tile. From this, you'll be taken to this dashboard and we'll go into each of these aspects in more detail now. Um, all of the same reports and information that you previously received on the email PDFs, you can now access using this um, search site dashboard and is also customizable and you can also print them out in PDFs. So for example, here we've got this analysis info. If you click onto your customize um, ASVVs, you can customize to be looking at the traits that you have an interest in and you can select up to 20 traits to be able to have a look at and search for. 
Additionally, if you click download PDF and software file, you can download either all of them or individual um, results, as well as um, generating an XML for you to import back into your software. We've also still got ex exclusions and linkage. As you can see, linkage was previously on the Genetics Trend PDF, whereas now it's in its own tile. If you are looking at your exclusions and you click onto the one purple, uh, circled in purple, which is your exclusions report, it will now present like this. It is customizable for you to be able to filter based on year drop, or you can just filter on all. And you'll have all of the exclusion types listed below. Additionally, we've got our genetic trend reports here, and these are also customizable based on what you're interested in. If you'd like in more detail, you can click on the genetic trends report, um, which is circled in purple, and it will take you to a page that looks like this. Now, your genetic reports are customizable based on the ASBVs you have interest in, whether or not you're wanting to look at all of your flock or individual sexes, so males and females, whether you're wanting to compare flock, breed and analysis or any combination of the three. You can also have a look at your date range, so the different years that you've um, imported data for. You can also choose whether you'd like a graph view, which is what we've currently got, or a table view and you can download this information to print into PDFs for your own use. Additionally, we've got a summary of the amount and type of um, data that you've been submitting to Sheep Genetics. If you click on the summary report, which is highlighted by the purple arrow, you'll go to a page that looks like this, and it is, again, um, downloadable into a PDF. You can also select all, which I currently have on the screen, or you can have a focus trait. Reproduction, uh, for the maternals and merinos, you'll have access to the reproduction counts report, which looks like this, where you'll have, um, once again, downloadable, and you can have a look at the year joining and those um, component reproduction traits that Emma was discussing. For the other analyses, you'll have access to the reproduction summary report. Another part of accessing the results is the individual listing and the genomics, and these tiles look like that. Um, you can click on the individual listings for the different scenarios of your current drop males or females, your genotype males or females or current size and dance if they're available. Um, and your pedigree and consistency report looks very similar to what the PDF one did. Uh, the percentile ban, so as we said, it is very important for you to be able to re-benchmark your yourself as where you sit and what a good um, ASB value is for all of these different traits. The accessing percentile bands is at the bottom of the results dashboard. Um, it has a bit of a summary on the bottom, as you can see on the screen. However, if you click the purple link, um, sorry, the link that's highlighted in purple, it will take you into a more in-depth look. And you can again customize these to what you're interested in. So you can do analyses, download, and um, the types of traits you would like to see. Um, so that's the changes to reports. Uh, feel free to unmute if you have any questions about that. There is help documentation available um, that goes into more deep, um, in depth discussion of how to access and what all the different components are. Um, but we'll also go through on how to use the search site. So similar to before, we have the scenarios on the top of the search site screen. So I'm a breeder, I'm interested in maternals, um, and these are my key traits. Additionally, you can also apply additional filters um, that you're after. So you can have a look at the different types of breeds, whether there's a particular birth year you're interested in, if you're looking for male or female, um, a group member of a breeder group if you're interested in that, if you have a particular stud in mind, um, and all of these um, different aspects, so your progeny, your pedigree, your location, and your ASBBs also have additional um, filters for you to be able to hone in your search as to what you're um, specifically looking for. So this is a search that I quickly did and grab a screenshot of. And just for reference, this was a maternal first cross sire search. I then filtered on border Leicester's rams, and I also filtered on progeny that had more, that sorry, rams that had progeny in more than one flock. And this is what it came up with. And this is what we call our data view. So as part of the redevelopments, we've um, allowed a couple of different views. This one's currently the data view. 
This is what we call our graph view, which is listing those same values just in a more visual way. And we've also got our condensed view, which allows more animals to be shown on the screen at one time for quick um, comparison. So if you're interested in having a look at a few other things on the search site, um, you can see in the yellow I've highlighted where you can change between that data view, that graph view and that condensed view. In the purple, this is where you can customise your ASPV, so you can have a look at the trait that you're interested in. Um, you can have up to 20 traits on display at once, and you simply just import them by clicking on the ASBV or search for ASBV index um, drop down, selecting the traits you like, and they'll fill up these spare columns here on the screen. Additionally, you can highlight which um, animals in there are in the percentile, so you can have the top shown in the different colors, and you can also put in the bottoms if you would like. If you click on a particular animal, it will go through and show you some information based on where it's located, if the breeder has a phone number or contact details up there, any pedigree that's available, as well as the list of ASBVs. If you scroll down from that page, you'll reach what you currently have on the screen, which is um, some selection indexes, as well as some additional information such as health and welfare, growth, carcass eating quality, wool and reproduction. If you click on the traits observed, it will pop up with this little um, icon here. And these are the traits that it has recorded for it. So you can go through and have a look at which ones are recorded for that particular animal if you're interested in animals that have that measurement. So these changes will be um, seen by all breeders and service providers with a sheep genetics login. The results, as I said, will be accessed via the search site, so it is essential for you to make sure that you are linked. Any additional improvements to the search site based on industry feedback will be gone through here, and you'll be able to see them when they arrive. Additionally, as I said, it is really important that you have a search site login firstly, and that both you and any service providers you wish to use are linked to your flocks, and there is help documentation available to assist you through that. Thanks, Chloe. Um, so I just um, thought we'd jump in with some quick take home actions uh, to conclude, given, you know, I've, uh, we've probably done a bit of an information dump. Um, if you do want any more information and a little bit more background on each of the changes and why with there's breeding value movement, strongly recommend jumping on, on our website under uh, updates, analysis enhancements, we have our videos and documentation really going into a little bit more detail than what we've covered today on the enhancements. Um, I've also uh, recorded this webinar, so happy to share that with you both if you'd like some more to spend some more time, particularly when results become available for Merinos, um, to, to you know listen to what Chloe spoke about with how to access those results um, and, and work through that. So we can, we can share this link with you. But the take home, Real key take homes, I think, to really get the most out of the enhancements that we've heard about today. Um, one thing you'll need to do is make sure you're using the most up-to-date version of your on-farm software. So if you're using Stockbook, Practical Systems, Pedigree Master, Breed Elite, um, just make sure you have the latest version of that software because that will help you, allow you to download those results into that software um, for you to, uh, to to use breeding values, et cetera, in the yard. So that's a really key one. Um, so recommend getting in contact with your software provider. Uh, for anyone impacted by the new reproduction breeding values, weaning rate, I recommend jumping on uh, and having a look when you get those results in that reproduction uh, count section that Chloe highlighted, um, just to understand what data is in the system that is driving your breeding values. So have a look at have a look at that one. The data quality score, which um, some of you might have seen the old ramping up genetic gain reports, the data quality score really is the um, a, an updated version. It's quite exciting to have this available. So jump in, have a look at your flocks data quality score, see what information, see where you rank and what, where your improvements are and what you're doing well. If you are using a service provider, uh, make sure that they, they're linked to your account, which you can do via that uh, My Flocks tab that uh, Chloe showed. That'll show if you have a service provider 
uh, that you are using if they are linked. Uh, and really for, but for the index changes um, for all analyses and, and particularly the inclusion of weaning, weaning rate, really recommend looking at those percentile, percentile band tables um, that Chloe, Chloe and Emma and I had um, to really get re-benchmark ourselves, okay, we used to think the good, this was a good breeding value. Now the top 10% is this, the top 20% is this. Really cannot stress that enough because otherwise you'll be just seeing big drops or big changes. Um, but relative to what's happened to everyone else, you're probably ranking, you know, the, the top flocks are still ranking as top flocks, the bottom flocks are still ranking as bottom flocks. And, and take your time when those, that results section becomes available for you. To, to, to have a bit of an explore. If there are any issues, please let us know. Um, and overall, just to just to finish up, um, the if you do have any questions about ASBVs or indexes, as I said, um, Chloe, if you just jump onto the next slide, if that's okay, um, the please contact your development officer. So if you're land plan development officer, there's Gabby's details. Um, if you're Merino, there's Chloe's. Um, really, if there's breeding values or index concerns, please contact those guys. If you do have questions about um, the results uh, or how to access or how to get your flock linked, please contact our front desk. Um, we're daily making improvements to the website um, to access those reports. So if there are any things that, you'd, that are not working properly for you, please let us know. Um, we might be able to fix them right on the spot, but we will add them to the list of things and we've got a really good way of, of making sure we're updating the website as we're going along. Also, what's under development is we understand these changes are big for, for you as, as ram breeders, but they're also going to be um, coming into sale season later in the year. Um, it's going to be pretty important for your buyers to understand if they were looking at number of lambs weaned in catalogues before, to understand that there, there's a new trait being weaning rate um, so we want to have documentation that you can you can use in your catalogues as well. So there's we'll be continuing to release new resources um, and new updates to the website. But there, if there is anything in addition, please do not hesitate to uh, to reach out. So that's everything we had planned. Um, Shelley or Deb, do you do you have any other questions um, that we haven't covered today, or wanted to spend a bit of time on? Uh, yes, I've got a question. The new weaning rate, do, yep. um, we're thinking of um, doing some genomic uh, work instead of going out and individually uh, identifying the lamb to the ewe. How, how, will, um, how will that impact on that? Trade. Do I need to be collecting something else instead? Uh -oh. um, great question, Shelley. So we can still get weaning rate or enough information from using parentage tests to get weaning rate. Um, what we might do is Chloe and I might try and catch up with you and we can actually go through your reproduction reports and kind of make a bit of a checklist. Um, around what we need and, and when we need it to make sure that you're getting all of those component traits recorded correctly because um, they'll all be contributing to your weaning rate. So um, we do have like a ready-made checklist, but we'll, we can go through that with you. Um, so make sure we're getting all the right information. Yes, that would be grand. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the other good thing as well with weaning rate, so if you're doing uh, genomic testing, uh, the old number of lambs weaned breeding value, when you took a genotype, it wasn't actually influenced at all by, um, by the genotype. It wasn't what we call a single step evaluation, meaning we, it doesn't use genomic information. Whereas the new weaning rate breeding value is, it'll actually, if you genotype an animal, it'll go towards the calculation of that breeding value. So you still have to submit all the reproduction data, but it also enhances the breeding value that we get. So it is a much better analysis in that way than number of lambs weaned. But good question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that one, Dev. Um, good pick up on the EQ index. We had that one come through today. So our team, our team's working on that one as we speak. So um, hopefully that, I, I think the, from what we were understanding, the values are the right way around. 
uh, sorry, the values are correct themselves. It's just the wrong, wrong way around. So we're looking on getting that one sorted straight away. So thanks for that one. No worries. Well, if there's nothing else, guys, really appreciate you coming along today. Like I said, it was a good practice run for us on this one, being our first one. But um, yeah, if there's anything else, please don't hesitate to get in contact. Thank you. Thanks.